Welcome to Gold Derby and our Meet the Experts TV documentary panel. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Christopher Burke, producer and director of For Love and Life, No Ordinary Campaign, about one couple's fight to reclaim their future from an ALS diagnosis and create a movement for millions of others. Christopher, you have a personal relationship with, with Brian Wallach, the subject of this film. Prior to his diagnosis, you were classmates at Yale. So at what point do you decide you have to make some sort of documentary about him and how did you begin that process? Yeah, it actually started with um, a, a 60 second spot to help him launch his nonprofit back in 2019. You know, I think when when somebody gets a diagnosis like this, friend or loved one, the natural inclination for any human with a pulse is to reach out and say, hey, I want to help, you know, um, and, it, and it's really tough. You feel like your hands are tied with something like ALS, where you've got the entirety of the you know, neurodegenerative medical community working on this really hard problem and having a very difficult time making any breakthroughs. So what can one person do who knows nothing about medicine, right? Well, this is what I could do. And so I offered to help Brian. He took me up on that. And um, I hadn't seen him in years. You know, this was going on 20 years ago that we graduated college and uh, stayed in touch sporadically, but we were in different cities. And um, as soon as I got there and started filming with him, I realized that there was a lot more to this than could possibly be encapsulated in one short spot to help, uh, you know, a social media launch for his foundation. And uh, since I was in Chicago anyway, I kept the cameras rolling, interviewed Brian, interviewed his wife, Sandra, met her for the first time on that day. And I left there thinking to myself, all right, this is something bigger. Didn't know exactly what just yet, but over the next couple of months, it became clear to me that this belonged in a full full fledged documentary form where was he in his in his progression because it, you start the film and we see him on the beach in 2012 prior to the diagnosis and then it cuts to 12 years later and that's just like a real like it pulls you in to show like how fast this thing can can get work um talk about those first moments and where he was in his diagnosis when you actually came to meet with him yeah. And so that was early 2019. And at that point, he was he had been diagnosed in 2017. Um, and I had learned of it in 2018. So he was already, you know, a reasonable length of time into it. But if you didn't know, Brian, and if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't really have been able to tell in, in January of 2019. Um, there was a slight hitch in his voice and his step but he was very much still the Brian that I knew from college. Um, but given that ALS robs people of their ability to move and speak and eventually breathe, it was, let's just say a little more urgent to capture as much as we possibly could from him at that time. Um, and obviously it's a tragic and horrible thing for anyone, but especially for somebody like Brian, who's such a gifted orator and speaker. I mean, he was a trial attorney, a federal prosecutor, very, very smart guy, great with his words. Um, and to see that taking away his physical ability to speak doesn't do anything to his mental sharpness, but taking his voice has been a really hard thing to watch, but also powerful that we were able to capture what we were. Well, the, what's so fascinating about it is Brian is, he's just not the, the typical person that's diagnosed with something like this. I mean, he's, as you said, he's a lawyer. He worked on President Obama's campaign. He's a former federal prosecutor. So he cries a little bit and then he gets to work and he knows that getting things done require movements. And that changes decades of doctors saying you have Lou Gehrig's disease, which is what people call it in America um, and, or ALS. So it's a death sentence and they just sort of leave it at that. And he's like, no, we're, we're doing something. So, right. you know, what really set him apart and how was he able to galvanize and organize people and use that experience he had from from political campaigns and put that to work here? Yeah, Brian is just a just an amazing guy. Of course, I'm biased because he's an old friend. But if you watch what he's been able to accomplish, um, it has a lot to do with. If the, what I would call a very pragmatic and action oriented form of optimism that drives him. He is not 
you know, he, he's not unrealistic about things. I guess he might say he is sometimes in terms of shooting for the moon. But the difference with him is that he will make a lofty pronouncement, a lofty goal, and then he'll back it up because he knows that you have to burn the calories and that you have to bring people together to do that. Um, so it, it certainly started with him. Um, but then immediately he had an amazing ally and partner in his wife, Sandra, who's an equal powerhouse force of nature to him. And then their whole network of you know, political friends that they had from the campaigns. These are people who had cut their teeth as young adults, learning how to forge movements, as you said, and how to get things done, um, specifically in Washington. And, and so, you know, it's the butt of a lot of jokes these days, Congress and the, the function of the US government, nobody's really that thrilled with it. But one thing that's actually pretty cool in this film is that we show that it can work and it can be a thing of beauty. And there can be people reaching across the aisle to agree and come together to help on something that's just a completely universal cause, which is saving lives from a disease that can and does target anyone and everyone in this country and around the world for that matter. Yeah, it was fast. One of the fascinating moments is when he testifies before Congress and he is such a great speaker. Um, and the way that he's able to deliver that message and get bipartisan support, I think they they get like $80 million more a year in, in research or something like that. So, you know, why did it take so many decades for like anything to happen? I, I think one of the big things that I learned from Brian early in this process is that there's an awareness gap with ALS. And part of the reason that happens is because unfortunately the patients die so quickly. And he, I remember sitting in an Uber with him in DC, riding to one testimony or another. And he was explaining to me that ALS is diagnosed at roughly the same incidence as MS, multiple sclerosis, but there's a higher general awareness about MS because people are able to survive for longer. Um, and partially that's the disease and partially it's the treatments that are available. But what happens with ALS is that, you know, the, the typical life expectancy is no more than two to five years. And then oftentimes it's misdiagnosed. And so you've got a lot less time than that. Even it financially and emotionally and physically drains, not, not only the person who's suffering the disease, but the families too. And so historically what has happened, as I've learned from a lot of the advocates is that families want to stay in the fight, but but they can't, you know, they've got to sort of somehow find a way to move on and reliving that pain again and again of losing someone to this disease can be too much for a lot of people. And so what Brian and Sandra realized was really missing was this sense of movement building that could become sort of a snowball effect and, and become self-sustaining, not only in terms of federal funding and things like that, but of being there for one another and these families and people being able to understand what others are going through and really galvanize and band together and support each other through this incredibly difficult thing. What was it like to have President Obama sit down with you and have a conversation with him about these, yeah. this couple? It, it was great. I mean, he um, rightly served as a large source of inspiration for Brian and Sandra in their early formative years. You know, those uh, wide-eyed 20-year-olds working on the 08 campaign. And um, I was impressed, but not surprised that he, he he didn't need any cue cards or anything. He came in clearly having read the briefing and knew a lot of uh, knew a lot about the issue. Um, he's been following their story, and um, he he remarked that he was really you know he takes a lot of pride in his alumni, so to speak, going on and doing big things like this in the spirit of the hope and change that he originally ran on. Um, and, you know, we, we did, uh, we had 30 minutes with him and uh, I, I made the choice to spend the last 10 minutes surprising Brian and Sandra with a, with a FaceTime call because uh, they weren't there. Um, and that was one of the top moments of my life, you know, being able to facilitate that and watching them talk and joke back and forth. And uh, President Obama, you know, jokingly taking credit for their entire relationship because they had met uh, on his campaign and then asking why at least one of their kids wasn't named Barack. But uh, so it was good. You know, he he really he had a, a lot of love for them and a lot of a lot of investment in, in seeing this succeed. And we see so much of the the failures of the healthcare system and and how that can be improved. But this is also really a love story um, between Brian and Sandra and how great they are able to communicate. What was it like just 
watching that relationship evolve over the years as his health deteriorated and you know she remains strong but we do see private moments where she breaks a little bit yeah i mean i think it took a incredible amount of vulnerability on their part to open up their lives to this it's it's not a movie it's their lives and we're just documenting it and it was it was hard you know e I would say equal parts beautiful and difficult, but probably a little more difficult than beautiful because so many things are being lost all the time, uh, whether it's them or some of the other families that we that we feature in the film. Um, we definitely had a lot of laughs, you know. Um, Brian joking about her putting a, pulling the needle out of the wrong place when she's doing an IV drip for one of his drugs. I mean, you sort of have to laugh through some of this stuff because. It's so difficult and painful. Um, the laughter and the love keeps them going in face in the face of unbelievable odds. And for me, the challenge was really just to figure out a way to be there and to be a fly on the wall, as as happens when you're trying to make a verite documentary and capture real moments between the two of them that could then play a role in in pushing the overall narrative forward. Um, so it was it was definitely hard because I do have an emotional investment in their lives with Brian being my old friend. Um, but again, this is the way that I thought I could give back best, not just to them, but to anyone who's going through ALS or another neurodegenerative disease. And I've talked to a number of patients and families at a lot of the um, film festival screenings that we've done and just had some amazing conversations and made a lot of friends and people who say that this film helped them to feel seen in a world where you often, as Brian puts it in the opening of the film, you feel like you've become the other and people don't want to pay attention to you because it distracts them from their normal life. It's hard to look at. Um, and so I, I look, I stared this disease straight in the face for four years making this film. And I think we've come up with something that is a heartfelt record of what one couple did to face it down and how they've been able to grow that into a movement that's having major positive ramifications. Yeah, it's incredible and um, so moving. And you learn a lot too about the healthcare system and the improvements we can make. Um, thanks for joining our TV documentary panel for Love and Life. No Ordinary campaign is streaming on Amazon Prime Video uh, on May 28th. And good luck this Emmy season. Thank you.